Good morning, everyone. Hi. Hi there. Good morning. Welcome to the 2023 Food Waste Solutions Summit coming to you right across the street from the gorgeous Gateway Arch here in the beautiful city of St. Louis, Missouri. Give it up, give it up. Thank you all so much for being with us this week. And thank you to everyone that's joining us virtually. We see you out there. My name is Angel Vesa and I'm on ReFed's Capital Innovation and Engagement Team. And I'm Vanessa Mukhevi on ReFed's communications team. So hopefully yesterday you got to a chance to meet some of our colleagues, but if you didn't, you can easily spot us with some red lanyards on. So please do not fret, say hi to us. We're very friendly. Um, one of our goals really for the summit is for you to get to know us a little bit better. So over the next couple of days, find time to connect with us, whether it's at a net networking break or during some of the sessions. And during a time when Beyonce and Taylor Swift are both in concert, we are so honored that you chose to join us here <laughs> in St. Louis. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You know, the Food Waste Solution Summit is all about action. And action is accelerated by collaboration. So as Vanessa was saying, we really hope you get to meet a lot of new people here that you can collaborate with. And for those of you that are with us virtually, get connected, share your comments through the app. Now, to get things started, we first want to give a special thanks to Ben Collier and the FarmLink Project for screening their documentary, Abundance, yesterday. Such a great film. Yes. We also had two friendly competitions yesterday, and I'm very excited to announce that the winners of the Out of Time Food Waste Trivia are, can I get a drum roll, please? Veggie Basket and the Low Hanging Fruit. Let's give them a round of applause. I'm also excited to announce that the winners of the Arcan Texture Contest are, please give it up for the Vultures. I gotta say though, it was a really close call and so wanna acknowledge the runner up and that team is La Ciudad de Ravioli Tostada. Give them a round of applause. Special thanks to Move for Hunger for facilitating the, co the contest, and a big thanks to Target for providing the boxes and canned goods that gave us the chance to do this contest, all of which will be donated to the St. Louis Area Food Bank at the end of our summit. But you have got to check out these really impressive structures in breakout room F, and please take some time to enjoy the other creative artwork that we have on display. We're really proud to be able to feature a youth art exhibition created by K through 12 students that participated in last month's Food Waste Prevention Week hosted by Elaine Fior and Elaine Blatt. And special thanks to Vanessa for coordinating that awesome exhibition. We're also gonna be screening the film Compost Fever created by Kenneth Moss from Baltimore Compost Collective. So be sure to check it out, yeah. Oh, and I have to mention the fantastic field trips yesterday. I hope you all got to participate in one and started to learn about the wonderful food community here in St. Louis. Yes, we are so excited to be in St. Louis, which has such a vibrant food community. St. Louis is located at the confluence of two major rivers, the Missouri and the Mississippi. The fertile soils in the region have supported abundant plant and animal life for thousands of years. But St. Louis has a long and storied history that long outlives colonial narratives. The land that we are now on and occupy was originally home to the ancestral, traditional, and the contemporary lands of a wide variety of Native American tribes, Kaskaskia, Osage, and other nations. We recognize their sovereignty and ne was never ceded after unjust removal 
and encourage your own research in tribal sovereignty in the lands that you reside on. We promote the inclusion of tribal history and contemporary thoughts and actions into your everyday food reduction and climate action work. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm and support tribal sovereignty, history, and experience by elders past, present, and generations yet to come. So over the next couple of days, our focus is on food, and the indigenous population here in St. Louis has been monumental in developing the food systems in this city. Today, half of the nation's crops and livestock are produced within a 5,000 mile radius of St. Louis. And it is also home to abundant of food companies from Panera Bread and newly established companies such as Mighty Cricket. And just last year, it was announced as being the new food, great food city by Food and Wine magazine. And you'll also get a chance to taste some of these delectable new culinary restaurants by, by signing up to one of our no-host dinners later today. Awesome, yeah, and so just a few more things before we get this party started. First, please, please, please make sure that your event app is set to central time zone. That'll help make sure that you're at the right place at the right time. And also, please be sure to share what you're learning this week on social media. You can use hashtag foodwastesummit23, and please be sure to tag refed using at refed. We also want to take a moment to give a huge thanks to all of our summit sponsors. We have a wider variety of sponsors than we've ever had before, from food businesses to tech companies to solution providers that were just startups not that long ago. And we're really honored and excited to have such a robust ecosystem really represented by our sponsors and in the room today. And so with that, I'd like to acknowledge our platinum sponsors, Hellman's, and the Betsy and Jesse Fink Family Foundation. We could not be able to do this without them, and we are so grateful for their continued support. We also want to thank our gold sponsors, and we also want to acknowledge our bronze, silver, scholarship, and product sponsors, as well as all of our media partners and our on-site exhibitors that are with us today. So please join me in giving them a huge round of applause for helping us make this summit possible. And without further ado, please help me in welcoming Dana Gunders, Executive Director of Refed. Woo! Thank you. Let's hear it up for Angel and Vanessa. Woo. You guys are going to get the treat of having them the whole time we're here. Um, and while we're at it, can we hear it up for the refed, the entire refed staff? They have been working days, nights, weekends to get us to this point. They are complete rock stars. So as Angela and Vanessa mentioned, please um, reach out, get to know them while you're here. We'd love to um, hear more about what you all are up to. And an especially giant appreciation for Jackie Suggett, Lisa Accardi, Sam Buck, and our event support team, Meet Green, who probably aren't even in the room because they're running around like crazy, but. Um, <clears throat> and while I'm at it, thank you to our ReFed board members who are here and who do so much to support us. Their dedication, their passion is incredible. Board members, if you'll kind of raise your hand or stand up. Let's see a couple out there. Jeff, Chuck, um, Pamela, somewhere, Emily. Thank you, thank you for everything. So I did dream about giving this talk last night and in my dream there were like these eight-year-old girls who were doing gymnastics right in front and they would not stop. So I just wanna say thank you to you guys right here for like getting out of your back fence and just sitting up straight <laughs> without me even asking. Um, this is one of my favorite moments of the year. Getting to stand up here and welcome you, 600 almost of you who are so passionate and committed to putting 
food to its highest use, that you will fly all the way to St. Louis, which I'm discovering is the land of giant portions. So <laughs> if you are out to dinner as you're out and about, just be aware of that, otherwise you might find yourself, as we did at the Refed team dinner on Monday, in a very awkward situation where you are talking about how much food goes to waste over a lot of food that you will not be eating with you. Um, I am so thankful for the energy and the creativity and the new interest for some of you and the long dedication for others of you. Um, and it's just, you know, being around you really, it fills my tank. It refills my tank. Um, and I just hope that while you're here, you, you get to kind of refuel as well and kind of take this amazing energy of the community and take it out there, out there with you as you go back to your communities um, and do the amazing work that you do. Uh, there is one person, however, who is not here today, you may have noticed already, and that is Jesse Fink. Jesse is the founder of ReFed. Um, he remains one of the most passionate and dedicated food waste warriors around. But one day we were on the phone, and after chatting about a bunch of things, he sheepishly kind of says, you know, Betsy and I have this kind of once in a lifetime chance to go on this trip we were invited on and it kind of coincides with the summit and like, do you think it would be okay if we weren't there? <laughs> and um, I kind of paused and I had all of these thoughts concurrently. I was like, kind of first just a little bit shocked, like Jesse's not coming to summit. Um, the second was that I thought it was kind of funny that he was asking me if it was okay. <laughs> The third was, oh, I'll miss seeing him kind of stand in the back of the room so proudly, and, um, and I do. And the last was, you know, this is a real sign of maturity for us. And while there's no question, I will miss him, and I know many of you will miss him this week, and we're so thankful for all the support he's given and continues to give, um, that is where I would like to start us today. Folks, this whole food waste issue has matured. And there are indicators of this maturity all over. Um, we heard it on the Evergreen tour yesterday. 10 years ago, they said, we're a beer company. We don't care about byproducts. And now they've put $100 million into building out a, an upcycling facility. Um, for me, one of the most exciting indicators is that 10 years ago, I felt like I knew everyone who was working on food waste. And now I cannot possibly keep track of, of what's happening, and I hear about something new every day, and that's really exciting. But let me give you a few other indicators. This past January, President Biden met with um, Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau and Mexican President Lopez Obrador for the North American Leaders Summit. They made just six commitments to, related to climate. So one was to build out EV infrastructure, electric vehicle infrastructure at the borders, one was around ocean conservation, and one was to have a food loss and waste plan. There are two amazing things about that. First of all, the White House is working on a food loss and waste plan. <laughs> yeah, right? But secondly, never before has food loss and waste had such prominence as the top climate strategy that it is. And that prominence is popping up in other places as well. Chicago, for instance, included food waste actions as part of its climate action plan this year. Um, last year at COP27, the annual climate negotiation, food kind of made its first appearance on the scene and we're hearing that this coming year, um, it will play a much more prominent role in the COP28 negotiations, possibly even including food loss and waste on the agenda. Um, and as we'll hear more about later in the summit, we are about to have carbon offsets available for food waste reduction projects. Yeah, right? That is not only exciting as a way to help fund projects, but more importantly, in my mind, it adds a new level of legitimacy to the carbon mitigation potential that food waste <coughs> has. We know it has, right? Um, and speaking of, of funding things, um, we are seeing maturation on that side of things as well. This past year, the USDA announced $90 million in funding for food loss and waste. 
and EPA is distributing um, 350 million in recycling funds and over 5 billion in greenhouse gas reduction funds, both of which can include food waste reduction as part of the programs that can be covered. Uh, we've also seen a fair amount of investment mature from mostly early stage venture to later stage venture transactions and private equity, and we've even seen some exits, such as with Impact Vision, uh, Date Check Pro, and Imperfect Foods. And we are seeing so many solution providers scale. I've already talked to so many of you and heard about it. Um, you know, FarmLink, Afresh, Too Good To Go, Flash Food, Lean Path, Winnow, Divert, just so many more of you who are getting so big. Um, it's amazing. The next on my list here is data. And this one goes out to all my fellow geeks out there. If that's not with you, just kind of bear with me for a second. Um, the Pacific Coast Food Waste Commitment, a public-private partnership that now has 16 companies signed on, recently released an additional two years worth of food loss and waste data among grocers. So now the PCFWC has data from 2019, 2020, and 21 covering more than 50% of the grocery retail market in, on the West Coast in California, Oregon, and Washington. And what's so amazing about that is it's actual tracking data um, from these retailers. So for the first time, we're able to track actual changes over time and provide industry benchmarks, and that is something we have not been able to do before. So we hope that that is an indication of where things are heading on the data side. On the policy front, barriers to food donation are being removed. The, the Food Donation Improvement Act was signed into law last year. Yeah. And if you see Niyadi Shah, who's around here, give her an enormous pat on the back for that one, because she really led that charge. Um, and the FDA included food donation as part of its food code for the first time ever. Um, and we've had three bills reintroduced already. The Food Date Labeling Act was just uh, introduced last week with bipartisan support. Uh, the Zero Food Waste Act and the Compost Act were introduced earlier this year. And with the reauthorization of the Farm Bill this year, there's a real chance that um, all of this gets a little bit more attention and some of it, hopefully, gets included in the Farm Bill. Uh, and what's great is that so far, food waste has really remained a bipartisan issue. And some of the whisperings we're hearing is that, you know, there is interest in including some of this in the Farm Bill because it really is a bar bipartisan issue. Um, and rounding it all out, the media is continuing to take notice. Last year, we tracked more than 157,000 articles that had food waste as the topic, and that was an 81% increase over 2021. And it's, it's from a range of publications, too. My favorite was Teen Vogue. <laughs> I felt very cool. Um, but the topic was also covered in, you know, things like the New York Times, Real Simple, and kind of everything in between. Uh, we have matured at ReFed, too. We are now 20 staff strong. I always tell people we're small but mighty, but I have to start changing that to, like, small-ish but mighty. We were, we were able to update the Insights engine for the first time last month. It was no small feat. And we recently announced the winning grantees for the first open call of the Refed Catalytic Grant Fund, which re-granted more than a million dollars. And we're excited to have some of those grantees here with us for the summit. If you are a grantee, can you stand up, raise your hand? <laughs> Definitely check out the work they're doing. And after an extremely successful pilot year, our partnership with the Environmental Defense Fund in their Climate Corps program to have a food waste dedicated track to their fellowship has been made permanent. Um, and we're thrilled about that. This year, four of the host organizations are back for a second year, which is a seal of approval uh, for the program. And we're so excited to have most of our fellows here with us today. So if you run into somebody with an EDF fellow sign, um, ask them what they're going to be up to this summer. Fellows, can you kind of raise your hands? Yeah. <laughs> 
At REFED, we're also working on a range of pilot programs to provide more tailored resources to food business, um, to food companies and, and the industry. And we are excited to be partnering with the Harvard Food Law and Policy Clinic, NRDC and WWF on the brand new Zero Food Waste Coalition. Um, which is we are working to inform and inspire food waste policy around the country. And I'm super excited to announce that today, the Zero Food Waste Coalition is releasing a new state policy toolkit. Um, you can find it at zerofoodwastecoalition.org. Org, thanks for that. <laughs> um, so this toolkit has 15 different policy opportunities across six categories for states to borrow from, including model policies. And as many of you who, who work on this know, like this issue tends to be jurisdicted, if that's a word, at the state level. So really kind of like leaning into this opportunity to move state policy is an important step um, in the grand picture. And what's really exciting is that just a handful of years ago, we didn't really have those model, model policies out there yet. And now, with so many state policies being introduced, I mean, I think it was like 75 last year and 90 something the year before, something like 20 passing um, each year. I'm looking at Emily to make sure I'm getting my numbers right. <laughs> um, but we have real world examples and are able to kind of see these policies in action and I know states are watching each other. So it's really exciting to have this model policy toolkit. Huge amount of work. Thank you to um, everyone, Tori, Emily, Yvette, and the whole team who, who worked so hard on that. And make sure to check it out. All right, so looking at all of this, I think we can safely say we've made it past our awkward teenage years. But here's the thing, <coughs> excuse me, and I say this as matter-of-factly as I can, we're not making enough progress. And that's not a reflection of you, you all are amazing, you are the engine behind all of the achievements that I just went through, but, um, you know, we're not, we're not moving the needle as much as we need to be moving it. And I love, I love the passion in this room. I've loved meeting so many food waste warriors. Um, who's like, it's like a growing army of people joining the movement, but I think we need to move past being a movement. Um, <clears throat> if, as the numbers tell us, cutting food waste in half can actually reduce the conversion of an area of land the size of Argentina and cut biodiversity losses by 33%, and save more greenhouse gases than converting the entire electric vehicle fleet, and save water and help feed, feed people, and, and, and. If it can do all those things, why is funding to the space a drop in the bucket compared to something like electric vehicles? Why is there no actual office dedicated to this in the government? Why is Biden not hosting CEOs of food companies to talk about this and figure out what the barriers are and get past them? We need the level of work on this issue to be commensurate with the opportunity that it presents. Now, I don't have all the answers to what that means, but here are a few steps that come to mind. First, let's, as I was just talking to the EDF fellows about, let's get past the pilots. Let's scale those that are working. I love a good pilot like the next gal, but we have so many proof points. Can we just do this already? Every school in this country should have share tables and milk dispensers. Every restaurant and grocer, yeah, right? Every restaurant and every grocer should be selling their near expiration products on a Markdown Alert app. A recent pilot with two major retailers in the Pacific Coast Food Waste Commitment concluded that if the entire grocery sector were to implement enhanced demand planning software, almost 1 million tons of food and $2 billion worth of food could be saved. So let's scale the pilots. Second, attract more brain power. Not that we in this room are not collectively very brain powerful, but I want to 10 or 100x that. Next, strengthen fundamentals. Measurement is coming along, let's say. 
but I want to see it integrated into every mainstream inventory system, ERP, point of sale software, and have industry benchmarking be, you know, at the touch of, of every industry person's fingertips. Radical collaboration. Nick from Flash Food said it so nicely yesterday. We're not competing against each other on this. We are competing against the problem. Nothing works better than a good success story, so let's share them. Let's take on the problem together, and let's, let's create more international fabric so we can learn and share in the global conversation as well. And lastly, we need to face the reality of barriers. Some of these are super mundane and logistical. Um, others are, are business realities. Um, and let's not forget that the food system is full of barriers to equity as well. But we need to be honest about those barriers and we need to identify them and articulate them and figure out what's really in the way so that we can then go ahead and take them on. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Jigger Shaw. He's been a change maker in the renewable energy space and is now overseeing a $400 billion fund at the Department of Energy. But before he went into government, he, we were lucky enough to have him on our advisory council. And um, Jigger doesn't talk much, but when he does, it's like in these like three super powerful sentences that haunt me for the next seven years of my life. So um, here's probably the three that have haunted me the most. He, he would say, look, this issue is enormous. The opportunity is enormous and you need to think bigger. And those words always stick with me and that is my invitation to all of you throughout this summit and beyond. You are amazing, you are doing incredible things and I invite you all to step it up while you are here. Get real, think big, and I mean really big, collaborate radically and let's be a serious answer to the giant problem that food loss and waste is. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And um, <clears throat> I do need to note that, very sadly, due to travel snafus, Stephen Satterfield will only be joining us for the afternoon session today. So make sure you join us for that. Um, and in the meantime, not in the meantime, but um, so we will not be hearing from him this morning. And so first up, in the spirit of creating that international fabric, I'm super excited that this year we have um, two representatives from the international community to tell us a little bit more about what's working in other places um, and so that we can hopefully kind of mimic and at least get to know what the global conversation and success stories are looking like. Um, so we have with us uh, Rosa Roll, who is a senior enterprise development officer and team leader um, for food loss and waste at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Welcome, Rosa. And she's going to pass it right off to Clementine O'Connor, who is the focal point for food waste and sustainable diets at the UN Environment Program. Among other things, she also, Clementine, also serves on uh, Refed's Advisory Council. So welcome to both of you. And Rosa, I will hand it off to you. Thank you very much, Dana. Um, it's uh, a pleasure um, to be here today uh, to share with you a little bit of the global perspective on what we are doing to address the re reduction of food losses at the Food and Agriculture Organization. So I'd like to first start off by giving a little bit of our perspective on some of the issues. So up until the beginning of the, um, the end, sorry, of the 20th century, the main objective of the food processing industry in industrialized countries was to lower the cost of food while in a majority of the developing countries with whom we prioritize the work that we do, the focus was on increasing production with very little attention 
to sustainability in either context. Today, as a result, of our current consumption patterns and agri-food systems are contributing to high rates of food loss and waste, greenhouse gas emissions, all of the things that we've spoken about already by Dana, environmental pollution, and the degrad degradation of our natural ecosystems. So toward achieving the 12.3 target, we have to bring in a very strong and concerted focus on minimizing food loss and waste, as well as um, engaging in actions to recover and also circulatory actions to, re um, to assure that we can reduce and, uh, our food loss and waste in a sustainable manner to enhance the sustainability of our agri-food supply systems. And of course, there's quite a lot of momentum taking place in all sectors at all levels across the globe. And indeed, there are a number of successes that have been achieved. And what we're looking at is we don't have very much time left to 2030s, only about some six and a half years. And so we really have to scale up some of those successes that have been achieved if we want to reach the targets that have been set. Now, following on the 2021 Food Systems Summit, FAO's Data Lab conducted an analysis of the pathway documents presented by countries. And we found that two-thirds of the countries that presented prioritized the importance of reducing food loss and waste. And again, if you look at the top five priority actions, they can really give us some measure of direction in terms of the way in which we can go toward achieving some of these issues. The whole issue of awareness raising, addressing the whole food supply chain, education, capacity development, and data. Now, to get us on, say, more or less the same wavelengths in terms of my presentation, I'd like to share with you a few definitions um, as published by FAO in 2019, noting that FAO is actually designated as the responsible custodian of uh, food, the Food Loss Index, which I will talk about a bit later on in my presentation. So we define food loss as a decrease in the quantity or quality of food resulting from decisions and actions by food suppliers in the chain. And, not, and that does not include retail, food service providers, or consumers. Uh, in terms of boundaries, we are looking at measurement from post-harvest up to, but not including retail. Food waste, on the other hand, is the decrease in the quantity or quality of food resulting from decisions and actions by retailers, food services, and consumers. And my colleague, Clementine, will give you a lot more specific detail on that as the uh, UN environment takes care of SD, the, the, the food waste index target. So <clears throat> the work that we do at FAO is very heavily focused on food loss reduction in accordance with the mandate of the organization to work globally on all aspects of food and agriculture, food security and nutrition across the humanitarian development continuum. And we work with organized groups of stakeholders in what we call the traditional supply chains. Um, they supply the bulk of the food requirements of local markets. Um, and they are really a, a, one of our main beneficiaries because of the high levels of uh, food losses that they sustain. They often don't have very much background education. Um, and so capacity development is very critical if we want to make them um, to actually help them to overcome some of the constraints that they face. And as a result, um, we do quite a lot of work with them to help them to support them through development projects that um, help them to um, improve the technologies, also um, facilitating their actions to um, benefit in the process of uh, reducing food loss and waste. Um, I'd like you to take note of the packaging that you see here in terms of what is being used, particularly those plastic bags, at, as I'm going to address those in a, a minute. 
So to understand where, why, and how much food loss takes place in the supply chain, we have developed a methodology that is applied at the field level, and we work always in consultation and collaboration with the stakeholders um, to identify where, how much, and also what solutions are technically, economically, and socially feasible in the particular context, because if they're not willing to actually take up what is in, um, given to them, there's no point in actually doing that work with them. The solutions that we actually agree on, it's a mutual agreement, we then pilot those solutions with them, collect the data, analyze it, and then give them that information in a palatable manner that allows them to actually make decisions on the adoption of the, the technologies and to reduce food loss and waste. And here, working in a number of countries across the globe, we have found that harvest and also transport in particular are some of the major hotspots that are common to the work that we do in addressing losses in fruit and veg vegetable supply chains. So, if we look at this, the, the graph here, we see that if you follow the bright pink arrows, you see that in a traditional tomato supply chain as, that is operated by the people in Bangladesh, the pictures I showed you earlier, we see approximately 17% of tomatoes are lost between collection and the wholesale market. And then we have a further 29% of that fruit that goes to waste in retail within three days uh, after harvest in retail. And the major, the major underlying cause of this loss and waste is mechanical damage that results from poor packaging. That's where I refer back to those two plastic sacks that we, see, um, we had seen earlier on. But when we switch the packaging from these 50 kilogram sacks disposable plastic sacks to transportation in plastic crates, in rigid plastic crates, we see a, a tremendous difference in terms of losses. And we achieve in our work that we've done across many different countries, regions, no less than 80%, but in this case, 100% reduction in losses um, with two to 3% waste, sometimes zero waste after three days in retail due to better quality tomatoes. And by uh, applying those simple practices, very simple technology and simple practices of washing, cleaning, sorting, we generate a number of wins for these small holders in terms of economic benefit that results from better quality, reduced losses along the shelf life, as well as diversified market opportunities um, because when, once you can move into better quality production, there are opportunities that arise in terms of supplying supermarkets and getting into also the tourism sector um, because of the improved quality. From a social perspective at the household levels, that translates to better quality food and reduced waste, which makes a significant difference for low-income consumers that shop in these markets. And from an environmental perspective, fewer plastics go into the environment, less waste goes to landfills, and this is some of the work we're doing. Also, we're working now with the European Union funded projects that are looking at applying circularity to the market waste for the production of feed, um, black, the black soldier fly flies for use as feed in aquaculture production that can then be consumed by and generate jobs for many of these small producers and that was also would prevent that waste from going into landfills. <clears throat> now, through our work in the countries, we have noted that the greatest successes are achieved where governments provide an enabling environment. I think in Dana's um, presentation, we heard some of what is happening in the US context. But really, it's very important to work in countries. Our main port of call is ministries of agriculture, to work with governments that provide and support and, and facilitate 
policy and strategy development to tackle the issues of particularly of food losses and also who are willing to invest in capacity development in infrastructure and also in technologies and since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic we've seen a real upsurge in the use of uh, digital technologies the apps that connect a lot of the small producers to the markets and to consumers and I don't think this is going to go away I think this is something that is really going to to continue in terms of the marketing the development of market linkages we also um, have noticed that support for private sector activity and engagement through the development of regulations that facilitate the ease of doing business is critical a critical element of the enabling envir environment. Increasingly, we have, uh, on our projects, we do have um, the, the requests from governments to help to facilitate joint vent ventures through the development of uh, public-private partnerships to support, for example, specialized training of uh, the individuals working, organized le um, groups of individuals working in different supply chains that supply export markets or engage in cross-border trade. And also, uh, to a large extent, to support systems like the cold chain system um, that needs continuous repair, management, maintenance, um, which you cannot leave those types of initiatives and activities to put the public sector be because of the need for them to be adequately and properly managed. And so a lot of the times, these are some of the areas where you do find um, a lot of opportunity for the development of those partnerships. And often we facilitate in terms of helping to develop the, the, the contracts that are required to do so. Now I'd like to show a very quick overview of the food loss index, which I mentioned earlier on. Um, the food loss index is used to track progress achieved globally in reducing food losses. And it's uh, linked to SDG 12.3, but it's SDG is um, actually designated 12.3.1A as FAO works on food losses and, and Clementine and UN, UNEP works on the other aspect, which is food waste at the end of the supply chain. Um, the index is compiled on the basis of loss in the food balance sheets of countries. And countries are also supported in terms of estimation, meeting the national food loss indices. Um, and in this respect, at the, when you work at the field level with the countries in that context, we're also looking at what is happening in terms of losses at the field level. Um, so this is something that will, in the future, as more countries come on board, conducting those measurements, that will also add more information to what we currently have in terms of measurement. Now, um, FAO also, through many of its projects, is supporting countries to develop uh, the national food loss indices. And here you see examples of where this work is currently ongoing in terms of the capacity development support uh, to measure um, the levels of losses um, in, in Latin America, in Asia, and in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, here we see some of the, the data on, on published under the, based on the information collected um, through the, um, the, stud, the surveys and the analysis undertaken to identify um, what is happening in terms of uh, food loss reduction. Because it's very important to understand and to know where in the world that loss is taking place, how much, and also to, so that we can understand and we have a good perspective when we go into regions, countries, what it is we're dealing with. Um, so it addresses, this data addresses the occurrence of losses by the SDG region. If you look here, you'd see um, the US and the Europe 
are the areas where you have the lowest levels of uh, losses as compared to, say, sub-Saharan Africa, where the levels of losses that are sustained are extremely high. And then it also looks at the breakdown of the levels of the food losses according to the categorization by groups of different categories of food. Um, for example, you see on the graph that speaks to title um, global and food group, um, you see that the highest levels of losses are consistently sustained in perishables, the fruits and vegetables, up to about, say, 32%. And in grains, you would have somewhere on of the, the least when it comes to the crops. And so <coughs> we see that that blue bar at the top, and that, the blue, that blue bar represents the Global Food Loss Index, which uh, um, in our last um, measurement after three years, evaluation, calculation after three years, we have seen a 1%, approximately 1% drop from 14% in 2019 to now uh, 13% um, of the food produced in 2020 did not reach the retail level. So the idea is that the food loss index is going to be measured every three to possibly five years. So to summarize, as we move forward to the future, we really see the need to scale up and scale out the successes, because we've seen a lot of successes happen in, in various regions across the globe. And then to look at uh, more in terms of how what we can do to scale up <clears throat> measurement reduction, as well as the monitoring of the reduction of food loss and waste to achieve the SDG target 12.3. Um, by doing so, we will improve the efficiency of our agri-food systems, as well as the sustainability. And in the process, we will maximize win-wins because we'll be contributing to other SDGs, in particular uh, SDG 2, uh, Zero Hunger, uh, SDG 13, where we have one of our biggest concerns, which is about the greenhouse gases and climate change, and then the SDGs that deal with water and land or natural resource base as well as the number eight that deals with the economy um, and the employment. And by doing so, we will make a big difference is in, in terms of uh, helping to support the transformation of our agri-food systems. Uh, this concludes my presentation. I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thanks so much for the uh, invitation to be here. It's bright up here. Let me get this uh, started. Uh, I am the uh, focal point for food waste at the UN Environment P Program. We work on food loss and waste because it generates 8 to 10 percent of greenhouse gas emissions because agriculture and waste are the first and third largest sources of methane, which is responsible for around 30% of the current rise in the global temperature. Food, um, we work on food loss and waste because it's a terrible waste of money uh, in the range of $940 billion per year, and it's an awful waste of new um, nutrition when one in nine of us, or 828 million people, are affected by hunger and 150 million children under the age of five have stunted growth due to a chronic lack of essential um, nutrients. Our role in 
tackling food loss and waste uh, mandated by the UN uh, Environment Assembly uh, Resolution 4.2 focuses on data advocacy, cooperation and capacity building. SDG 12.3 provides a clear framework to measure and track pro um, progress on food loss and waste uh, reduction. And as you've seen, it has separate objectives on loss and waste. And we as custodian of the food waste uh, indicator published the Food Waste Index report in 2021, and we've just begun to up, update that. Uh, so and the new uh, report will be launched in September or October of this year. So keep a lookout for that. Um, the Food Waste Index report provides global and country level food waste estimates based on best available data and shares a common approach for countries to measure and report on food waste under SDG 12.3. It finds that nearly a billion tons of food went to waste at the retail and consumer level in 2019. In Importantly, the Food Waste Index shows that in almost every country around the world where household food waste has been measured, it is significant. It shows that this is not something that only affects high income countries. It is a problem around the world. There is a global average of 74 kilos or 163 pounds of household food waste per person per year, which is higher than, uh, which, mean, um, which means that we waste more than our own body weight on that average in food each year. To help Countries uh, around the world that are just getting started on this, we launched regional food waste working groups in Asia, Africa, and South America, um, which provide support on it. measurement and reduction of food waste through workshops and one-to-one -one, uh, guidance. Uh, we are also working through G20 processes where many countries that already have good food waste data need support to uh, 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 overcome uh, bottlenecks uh, and, and accelerate action. Um, we focus on four proven approaches informed by experiences in countries such as the UK that have already reduced their food waste by 27%, which shows that this is possible at scale. Um, and uh, our focus is on consumer behavior change programs, public-private partnerships, circular food systems, transitions, and policy and climate strategy. Um, I'm going to give a quick example of our capacity building work to develop a public-private partnership on food loss and waste in, in Brazil. Oh, sorry. Uh, and here are the approaches that are mapped uh, across the waste hierarchy as well. So you see how those fit. So back to Brazil. Um, a 
public-private partnership is a collaboratively agreed, self-determined pact to take action th um, th um, th through which we can work effectively across supply chains. So with support from APA and together with RAP and partners on the ground, uh, we assess the interest and uh, feasibility for such a partnership in Brazil, where an estimated 30% of food goes to waste, while 55% of Brazilians suffer from food uh, insecurity and 15% and from severe hunger. Here you can see that there's a lot of uh, overlap between parts of the country that have high amounts of food waste and high levels of uh, hunger, which helps us to target the work there. Um, so the public-private partnership model is led locally. It's built to respond to the country context. It's reasonably fast and 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 flexible, and it's already working uh, effectively on five continents. We consulted, uh, so we consulted in Brazil a wide range of actors from the public, private, and NGO sectors. We identified uh, in initiatives are on the ground that we could build on and uh, align with. We looked at key uh, food uh, value chain players uh, in Brazil, and you'll see that uh, Ambev is a big actor in Brazil as well. And we identified um, <coughs> promising first mover signatories that are based on companies that are already active on public private partnerships on food, arts and waste uh, in a range of countries. So we put in place uh, an a implementation plan, a timeline, a funding strategy to 2030 to make this happen, and we're working on the funds to, um, to get, that, get that moving now. So on a slightly different note, uh, UNEP convenes together with FAO, the intern National Day of Awareness on Food Loss and Waste should have a bigger title. Don't know what happened to that, but it takes place on the 29th of September each year, and it's going to be held in person for the first time this year in in Rome. So please come and join us for that. Uh, come to talk. Um, Come to talk to us about collaborations for the day. We'd love to work with you on that. And register your uh, associated uh, events on stopfoodlosswaste.org. Um, at COP27, um, a wide range of partners, including a good few who are here today, launch the 12.3 pledge. It is an action um, a movement with the goal of reducing food loss and waste and its greenhouse gas emissions. It brings a wide range of actors together to make new and additional um, commitments that contribute to the reduction of food loss and waste and its building momentum to some big events this year at COP28 in, in Dubai. 
Um, we have de de developed um, a guidance on the integrating food loss and waste in country climate stra um, uh, strategies or NDCs. Clearly articulated NDCs are essential in accessing climate finance to take action at scale. So that's particularly important. Um, and to close, we are now halfway to 2030. Uh, Countries with food loss or waste in their NDC, they cover only 21% of, of the global population. There are major upcoming uh, opportunities to accelerate action on the Horizon. I note in particular the Secretary General's Cl um, uh, Climate Ambition Summit that will be taking place in September. And with incredible partners in this room, we have exciting new work that's about to launch to uh, understand the drivers and scale interventions here in the in the US. Um, so we can't wait to work with you, and thanks a lot for your attention. All right, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. It felt really good to stand to get up here, and I bet some of you with Apple Watches or Fitbits are buzzing right now. So everyone can stand up if you want really quick. Take a stretch. I'm no Emily Ma, which those of you who attended last year will know what I mean. So I'm not going to lead you in a really robust stretching exercise. Um, she, she raised a new bar there. But yeah, go ahead and stretch. All right. Hopefully that's good. All right. OK. Um, I just want to say thank you to our keynotes, Rosa and Clementine. I hope that gave you all a bit of a sense of the conversation that's happening globally on this issue and just for framing that for our opening session of the summit today. Um, we're going to wrap up this session now with a quick conversation. We're going to bring it a little bit closer to home. We're going to talk about some of the great work that food businesses are doing here in the U.S. and also about a partnership that's been alluded to a few times now, the Pacific Coast Food Waste Commitment. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, but a lot of really great work happening through that that we're going to talk through a little bit as well. So I'm joined on stage by three amazing partners of ours. This is Marie Davis from Aramark. We have Mona Lisa Prasad from Compass Group. And we have Suzanne Long from Albertsons. Um, it's not often that we get retailers and food service companies on a stage together, I don't think, to talk about the work that you're doing. So I actually want to start there a little bit. Um, Retailers and food service companies both sit at a really interesting part in the supply chain, right? So you're working upstream and downstream. You have really close and personal interaction with your customers, um, but you're catching them in different places. So let's maybe talk independently in your sectors or organizations. What is the burden or opportunity of where you sit in that middle ground? And Suzanne, maybe I'll start with you for this one. Sure. Well, good morning, everybody. All right, so um, the first thing I gotta say is, how awesome is it that so far everybody who's been on stage has been a woman? I just have to say. <laughs> Working in the grocery industry, this is a cool thing to see. So, um, so well, the way I would describe it to people is, you know, when you think about it, grocery stores are just big boxes, right? There's a lot of stuff that's produced upstream of us, and there's a lot of stuff that's consumed downstream of us. And all of that stuff has to flow through somewhere in order to get it to the right person, right? And so the interesting intersection that we play is that we see that waste that gets created upstream. We create some of the waste within our own stores. And then we, we have limited ability to influence what happens downstream of us. And so, but I believe that because, you know, people think of Albertsons as a, you know, I think as the banner Albertsons, but it's actually Albertsons company. So we're the second largest food and drug company, 
you know, in the US, we have 2,300 stores, we have 33 million customers a week that walk through our doors. And so I think the interesting role that we play is that consumers get a lot of information through their grocery stores, right? Whether it's through an app, on shelf, in store, through advertisement, through circulars. And I think one of the interesting opportunities we have in this space is how are we using some of those channels to share this issue and, and be a voice in support of solving the problem. Great, thank you for that perspective. Marie or, or Mona Lisa, anything you wanna add? Yeah, um, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear myself, there you go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so good morning everyone, and I kinda wanna second what Suzanne said as well. You know, while I was sitting there, I'm like, wow, all women on the stage, this is awesome, but <laughs> whoop whoop. Um, but I think it, it's sort of similar. So I primarily work um, just with colleges and universities across um, the nation with Chartwells. And it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting space to be in because you have kind of the back end of food loss and food waste, and then you have the consumer side as well. And we've heard a lot about change in behavior, and I think that's where we're starting to see where we need to focus on. We do a lot of work um, tracking our food at the back end. Associates are all excited about it now, which took a while, to be honest. Um, but it's, it's, I think, at this stage, the influence that we'll have by talking and keep talking about food loss and food waste in partnership with retailers, in partnership with those national brands that we partner with as well, makes that greater impact, if you will. Yeah, and I think that what I would add to that too, um, so in my role at Aramark, I'm an enterprise team, and so, you know, um, like compass so many different verticals, we get to work in so many different spaces. So we also have this unique opportunity to educate consumers of what that means in a sports environment or in a hospital or, you know, in a K-12. So uh, just really thinking about all the different ways that we're messaging and working with our employees to target the issue. But I think the other exciting thing that's starting to happen that wasn't really happening before is our ability to have some of those conversations upstream and maybe even utilize some of that imperfect produce or talk with our partners about how we can work together. I was kind of thinking about like what Rosa was saying about within the supply chain, like what things can we do to help improve the waste upstream before it even gets into our operations and how we can partner together on that. So it's exciting to see that opportunity opportunity starting to evolve. Great, thank you. And Mona Lisa, I think you started getting us towards this idea of the collaboration a little bit. So that's what I wanted to ask next was, um, when we talk about collaboration, I think we often think about businesses in the same sector, so you collaborating with fellow retailers, or we think about businesses in the same supply chain, so food service companies collaborating with your food suppliers, right? Not often do we kind of cross those boundaries of retail to food service. I think it's interesting, as has already been noted, that you're actually serving the same people, just in different places, and you're actually buying from a lot of the same companies as well. So talk to me, what are your ideas? Um, what, what do you actually see happening, or what are your ideas of what could happen to get creative with that collaboration and have more collaboration between your organizations, retailers and food service companies? Yeah, I can sort of kick off. Um, I work a lot with national brands on our campuses, um, so you know I won't name them out here, but when we're talking to national brands to come on campuses, they specifically sometimes have a brand guide or they have specifications of X amount of, let's say bagels, breakfast time, um, bagels must be kept in the shelf, you know, till the end of business or, you know, if it's 2 p.m. that you're closing. But what happens is obviously you have so much left and no one coming and then again, it goes into that food waste kind of s sphere of things. So we're starting to have the conversations with national brands to change those guidelines, to change their brand guide, because it's only then I think we can change the way we're operating and reduce that food waste. Because again, you know, from operators, we always hear when I'm going around, just like just checking or auditing or something, the one thing that I'll always hear is, hey, but you know, we're gonna get audited by someone who walks in randomly and I'm gonna get a ding and I don't want that, which I get from the operator and they can't do anything with that. So which is why we're you know, tapping into national brands, some of our retail kind of supply chain system there to change that narrative. So we've seen success 
with two brands in particular. Um, I'll, I'll name one out here, which is Chick-fil-A, and I know their partners here as well and sponsors. And they've worked really well with us in the fact that, yes, we don't have to like batch cook and you know cook a whole ton of fries or chicken or ha what have you in, in the kitchen so that you don't have that food waste. And I think technology plays a great role as well because, again, it's... You know, it's KDS systems in the back of house. You're preparing just to that order. You're not cooking, I don't know, a pound of chicken um, at once. And those conversations have definitely been helpful. Um, and I just see it evolve a lot more as well because national brands are becoming so prominent in colleges and universities. So again, changing, I think, that brand narrative and their guideline is really important for us. Well, I think from a grocery perspective, you know, um, I know everyone is so t sick of talking about COVID, but let me just give you one of the silver linings that happened in that is that, you know, early on in the pandemic, restaurants shut down like within a day, mm -hmm. but grocery stores stayed open, which meant that there was a ton of food in the food system that we had to rescue because people were rushing to grocery stores, right? We, we, had to, we had to protect our supply chain and we wanted to protect all of this food. And so the amount of collaboration that happened between grocery stores and food service was unbelievable. I mean, think of pallets of eggs, mm -hmm. right? That needed to come into our stores, get reboxed into 12 count so that we could sell them, right? So the amount of collaboration, and I think, so I think we saw sort of that unlock. We saw that as an emergency, which is one of the reasons we did it. I think we got to figure out how do we make this feel mm -hmm. like an emergency every day to do that. So that's number one. Um, but I'll give you, uh, number two is, I'll give you an example of a place where I see this really being a powerful value chain. Is um, last year, um, uh, Matt K. Mine was um, on stage, uh, I believe, and, uh, or one of the K. Mine brothers was on stage. Anyway, um, and they talked about do good foods, right? Which is the idea of you take organic waste, you turn it into chicken feed, that chicken feed is then fed to chickens, and then those chickens are actually sold in stores, right? Well, sometimes the food system doesn't work exactly like that, but the power of what they're creating is amazing. We're actually um, one of the biggest um, sort of suppliers to do good foods in terms of organic waste. And so what we found is actually, even if for one reason or another, like which chickens are being fed that organic product mm -hmm. may not be the same places where we source our chicken, but it is the same place that food service companies source their chicken. And by the way, the way you purchase chicken in a grocery store is different than the way you purchase it in food service, right? With us, you buy a pack of chicken breasts. At a food service location, you buy a chicken breast, right? So the way that quantities work is dramatically different between those. So there's this working across the food system opportunity to say, hey, we can provide the organic waste, somebody else can turn it into chicken feed, and it can turn into chickens that are used in the restaurant or food service industry. So I think that's an example of when we're collaborating, we can find ways through that, as, a, as opposed to just saying, well, then the grocery stores must buy all that chicken. That bring, I'm going to just jump in really quick and then I'll let you add on. That brings up an interesting point that I think we talk about is like why do we collaborate? What's the purpose? And it's so often where these incentives are misaligned, yeah. right? Where the cost and the benefit is not in the same place. But where let's look past that and see where we can actually still find opportunities to collaborate to bring the value to everyone. So the great, great example. Marie, sorry to cut I, you off. I was just going to say, I mean, I think it's, it's exactly what Suzanne just said. It's like, you know, we, it, it does need to become this emergency. It's like no stone unturned. And, you know, instead of working in our silos now, we've got to talk together. And, you know, I think that collaboration is key. So just going to add that. <laughs> yeah, no, great add. So I think part of the goal of, you know, moving forward is creating forums for this collaboration to happen more easily. And I want to now kind of talk a little bit about the Pacific Coast Food Waste Commitment. Um, for those of you who are new to that commitment, this is a public-private partnership along the west coast of the US and Canada. We have state and local jurisdictions from those states and, and province that are a part of it, as well as 16 leading food businesses and then nonprofit partners, so ReFed, World Wildlife Fund, and RAP. Many of them are actually here today. Can you, can you stand up if you are a signatory, a jurisdiction lead, or a nonprofit and part of the PCFWC? There are a lot of you. I know there are. So there we go. <laughs> and everyone up here, yes, you don't have to stand. But yeah, just thank you for giving them a round of applause. They are doing a ton of work, um, kind of above and beyond the call of duty within their organizations to tackle this regionally. And 
we'll talk about this in a minute, but public-private partnerships are hard. <laughs> it's a great word that we all like to kind of hoorah around, but it's hard to execute, and so there's a lot of work going on there. Um, Dana gave you a quick preview earlier of just some of the data that's coming out of that group. We have nine different pilots that were run last year in that group as well. So encourage you to, to take a look at some of the, the resources through our annual report online, or else I'll just keep talking up here about it because I'm so, I'm so proud of it. Um, but we've really spent the last four years trying to build strong pre-competitive collaborative action and going past the, the fuzziness of that word and trying to actually create a reality where the collective efforts of the group are actually better than the individual efforts they could do on their own. What's the value add that we can add uniquely on top of the things that they're doing every day within their businesses? So I just want to hear from each of you as, as part of that commitment, why? You're like, what, what drew you to it? Why add something else to your plate? What, what value do you find or what do you find yourselves doing that maybe would have been difficult to do without that structure in place? And Marie, I'll let you start. Sure. So um, the timing of joining on was really just super synergetic for us. Last summer, um, I had an EDF refed fellow, and one of the things that she was looking at is like, how can we better understand post-consumer food waste? And really, stars aligned and learned about um, Pacific food waste commitment. And um, I met um, Tara and her team from WWF, and really just from that moment on, just knew that was the next right move. But um, even this morning, we met and had breakfast together and already new ideas were emerging. I mean, I guess I think it's hard for food service providers to come together pre-competitively a lot because you are a business and you need to be competitive. But it seems like food waste is the issue where we've all really been able to kind of like open the curtain and, and talk collaboratively, and we're really excited. We're moving um, into starting a pilot process together to look at plate waste. Um, so it's just been a really powerful experience just the past year of getting to work with all the different providers together and wrap our minds around this issue. Sure. Um, sort of similar, right? I think we had a great little powwow session this morning um, for bre at breakfast, but I think you know, what drew me very close to it is, yes, there's data, yes, there's so much research, but there's so much more to the data. Like we've, we've heard from everybody this morning as well, we have the data, what's next, right? Let's change that momentum, let's move forward and do something. And I think it's focusing again, like you said, on that plate waste we have. We know that there's a lot, but also at the same time, speaking from a colleges and universities perspective, there is a lot of stigma um, that is associated with that as well. Um, so what happens is, say, in a dining hall, which is an all-you-care-to-eat facility, you often tell students that, hey, you can go back as many times as you want to the buffet line and get as much food as you'd like, but make sure that you're not eating you know, with your eyes first, right? Let's, let's not waste food. But I think that's where that collaboration and that research partnership is so helpful for us. Like, how do we change behavior by not, you know, negatively impacting someone's mental health or stigma that's associated to it? Um, oftentimes, like I, you know, when I'm touring a dining hall, for example, and I'm there just sitting and eating uh, my meal, I, I see people and students pile their, uh, pile, pile their plate up and yes, I, I don't go and talk to them because again, that whole stigma that comes to it, but we see the opportunity to change that and to change that, I think partnerships like and collaboratives like PCFWC, I got that acronym right, um, is very helpful um, to move the needle um, with students and Gen Z in general, I think. Yeah, I think from, from my perspective, you know, we are, there's no question, you know, as a, as a major grocery retailer, we're a big player, but we're not the only player. And, and while we have influence, certainly with our vendors, um, if we're not their sole or their primary um, taker of their product, it is still hard to have them move the needle. So the, the value of the collaborative, in my, in my view, is you have a collective push it's not just one voice, it's many saying, what could we change about this to make it better for all? And the other, you know, <clears throat> I think we think about, well, we wouldn't, uh, so like, let's take strawberries, which I think is one of the categories that we're focused on, right? Okay, so, um, thank goodness, I got that right. Okay, so on the strawberries point, right, there's the point about not wasting strawberries, but there's also the point about providing better quality 
strawberries, right? There's the point of, will it draw more people into our stores? Is there a sales side to this? Is there a, right, it's, it's not just about wasting less food, it's actually about enhancing the business that merchants and operators wanna see. And when we work together to do that, you know, the display of strawberries is better because it lasts longer and you, you have more confidence buying it. And, and I think in the absence of that, it's a little bit of pushing a rope uphill. It's saying, hey, I know we're 30% of your volume, but will you make a change for us? And they're like, no, because I don't have 70% asking me. And so when it's the 70% or the 80% collectively asking, we all benefit. Um, and then it's really about our own supply chains. How effectively are we getting that to store? How effectively are we displaying it, keeping it safe? But from the supplier standpoint, it, it has to be the greater majority or the move will never happen. That I think is one of the things I love about food waste as a topic is there are so many opportunities to view it collaboratively instead of, instead of competitively, while obviously maintaining the competition that has to be there to, to operate as a business. Let's, let's be honest and talk about the flip side of the coin too. You know, what, what's hard? Um, you know, I, I think I've already mentioned it takes a lot of time for something like this to actually work and to execute in a way that it is providing more value than what you could do on your own. So but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Be honest with us. What's hard about it? What can we be doing to continue to improve collaborative partnerships across business sectors? I can go on. Um, so uh, where do I start with this one, right? So uh, <laughs> that's not the start I was hoping I know, for. Right? But <laughs> I'm like, yeah, let's go. But um, you know, with often there's competition. Um, we're we're sitting next to each other, but we know there is that pre-competitive competition that is established, uh, right? The compasses, the arrow marks, the Sodexos, and things, um, which in a way is great because um, it brings us together when we're looking at sort of the tragedy of commons, if you will, or, you know, it, that's, it's the dilemma that we have, but we're coming together for solving that tragedy of um, commons there. So, you know, as an example, I'll give you an example of our, st our Stop Food Waste Day. So it's a global day of action, happens every last Wednesday of April. Um, I know April is a very busy month for everybody in this space. Um, and it follows right after Earth Day and, you know, the whole Earth Month culmination and things. But hey, it's, it's a global day of action that Compass Group put together, basically saying that what can you do and what will you do this year in the future in your homes, in a dining hall, in your workspace to reduce food waste as much as you can. So we've seen people from all walks of life, from retailers, different food service providers kind of come together to solve that issue that we have. And I say an issue because what happens is it arises with, you know, it goes towards an opportunity. And often, every time on Stop Food Waste Day, I always see an opportunity and have more collaborations at the end of April than I've ever had in the entire year because everybody is coming together collaboratively with that, be it Aramark and as um, Sodexo, other food service companies, retailers. So everybody in the space who knows that food waste is sort of a little bit inevitable in their operations. We're like, well, what can we do to get together? So I think that's the really cool part about it when you see, you know, pre-competitive um, people like us kind of come together in that space, really. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's like the perfect example. Um, I mean, the hard part is just getting the conversation started sometimes. Um, and I mean, I think really when I think about this, uh, a lot of the hard part actually comes in influencing the consumer itself. And so um, I we just haven't really gotten to that point where we're fully like aligned on like how, you know, what what's the thing that makes the change. Um, so, you know, just the fact that that conversation has started uh, is getting over the first hurdle. Yeah, I would say for for us, it's that I actually think that, um, well, two things. Um, I'm so glad the conversation has started mm -hmm. and we're talking to ourselves. That's what I think the biggest problem is. I mean, I can't make a move on a change to the way we do our supply chain with produce unless I'm working with our produce merchants and our operators, right? And so it's not... 
it's not getting in the room and having a great pre-competitive discussion. It's then the influence that you have to have to go speak to the people who can actually make the change. And so I think one of the changes are how do, you, how do we get those folks at the table together as opposed to us? We already collaborate. We're all fighting food waste, right? So, so I think there's an opportunity to get to a different place in the organization to make those more effective. And then I think we also have to recognize the differences between you know, running a grocery store and running a food service. An example is strawberries are a huge problem for the grocery industry, the freshness, how long you can keep them, all of that kind of stuff. Potatoes, I believe, which I think is another category that we're focused on, are a problem for you all. We don't shrink potatoes, people. Like, it is not a, it's not a category that's a problem for us. It's a root vegetable. I mean, think how long you can keep a potato in your house. It's not, it, it doesn't bruise easily, right? I mean, so that's a category where it's really, a very important thing for food service, strawberries are not. So it's good that we've each picked categories, but if we want to accelerate that, I think there also has to be a where does it make sense to be collaborating together mm -hmm. and where does it make sense to have two tracks so that you can make sure you actually cover categories that are most meaningful for that industry. Great, thank you. All that feedback is duly noted. We and really we love you. <laughs> <laughs> no, we love it. This, I think we're, we're making great progress on the journey and there's so much more to happen, right? But to your point, next year I wanna see 10 more tables out here with partners that didn't even know about food waste within companies that are now working on that with us. So this is great. Um, we're in the final minute. So I want it lightning round, 30 seconds, start your timer. Would just love to hear from you, closing comment, what are you either kind of most proud of in the last year that's been accomplished, or maybe a better question, what are you most excited about in this past, present, future panel? What are you most excited about in the next year for what's happening in food waste within either your sector, your industry, or the partnerships that you're a part of? Um, so I'm most excited that uh, they're just all the opportunities are on the table, whether it's like upcycled food or just the opportunities are even like arising within the leadership with the different verticals within my business. Like they're, the conversation is like happening within the culture of the company. And so, you know, I'm excited to see where within the next year those opportunities take us. Yeah, I don't know why I keep doing that. Um, <laughs> Lightning round. Um, so I think most happy about how we've implemented and sort of gone ahead with our waste tracking in you know almost 320-ish um, locations across the nations. It was a challenge to get to because not everybody was on the same page, um, and you know little little dinks here and there. But I think that's what I'm most like so pleased with that that every single one of our accounts across the country is tracking it. On the flip side, I think what I'm most excited to see next year is A, the results of what happened and you know, semester over semester, because we look at it that way. Um, was there a re reduction? Was there an increase? What really took place? But I think also on associate and consumer education, um, it, it's very different, right? It's, it's a different kind of approach to education for the back of house associates for us and understanding and teaching them what the importance is. And I want them to take it home. Like, don't keep it out here and switch off when you get out of the kitchen, right? Make sure you take it home and practice the same things. And on the other side, like to consumers, like I constantly see students, like they'll stand in front of the bin, don't know where to put it, and it all goes in the black landfill, right? It's so confusing. Students don't have the time. So I think that's a really big opportunity for us to kind of focus on for next year. But also, again, like, you know, we've, we've talked about opportunity. It's very exciting to see that because those are the Gen Z students that will come into the workforce that will then influence other people going forward. We'll probably be here in the room someday. So just very excited for all of it. <laughs> so uh, my biggest compliments, actually, to the Pacific Coast Collaborative because actually what you have built is actually the first truly working, I think, systems thinking approach to this. Cradle to grave, what happens with food, right? At least until it gets to someone's plate. I recognize we don't have as much control over that. But, um, but so I think the power of what's been created, and that's what makes me most exciting. It, I, one of the things we'll talk about in the breakout session that I'm in is that we see all of these point solutions, so many point solutions, and they're all, help, they're all helping to fight food waste except that we as retailers have to stitch them all together. It's a very complicated problem to solve. No one thing will solve it. And so the fact that there is systems thinking around that, and then I would say the second thing is, I'm really excited about figuring out how to do storytelling. 
I, I think what I said earlier is very true. I think many times we're talking to ourselves. We already all believe this is a problem and we already all wanna solve it. So how do we get more people in the game? Um, so I don't have that nut cracked yet, but I'm working on it. Whoever does, come up and talk to us afterwards. Um, help me give a big thank you to our panelists. And, oh, there go. and I'll invite our MC back to the stage. Thank you all so much for kicking off the summit on such a high note. You know, I was really personally inspired by Dana's words for us to think bigger. Um, and I really enjoyed hearing about the progress that's being made internationally and all this collaboration in action. This is really wonderful. So coming up next, we have our very first networking break. You'll have 30 minutes to connect with your colleagues and hopefully build some new relationships. Also, definitely check out the exhibit booths just located right outside in the main atrium area by the escalators. Um, there are also a number of virtual exhibits, and you can contact the exhibitors directly and set up meetings through the app. Our first breakout sessions start at 11 o'clock, so check out the event app for the topics and locations. And we'll also have our lunch break beginning at noon with a buffet right outside this main stage room. And you know we couldn't have this event without talking about food waste solutions unless we implemented it in our own meals. So it's been a lot of fun working with Chef Joseph and his team to make sure we're, you know, whole product utilization and, and sourcing locally. So I hope you guys enjoy the meal. Um, after lunch, we'll have another round of breakout sessions starting at 1.30. Then at 2.30, we're hosting a structured networking and future casting session in partnership with Food Bites. So check out the letter on the back of your name tags that tells you which breakout room you're supposed to be in. And note that if you have the letter P, it indicates that you should be in the Parkview room. And so that takes place right before our closing main stage session for today with some amazing speakers, including Steven Satterfield. And we'll be talking about intersections of food waste with issues of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and what that means for all of us as we work to build a sustainable, resilient, and inclusive system. Also, please be sure to take part in our summit scavenger hunt. Even if you're attending virtually, you can still take part. You can get more details at the registration desk and on the event app. There's a scavenger hunt banner as soon as you open up the app. And don't forget, the winner gets a free ticket to the summit next year. Awesome. So thanks. We'll be back soon.